this is a video uh, about my PhD, like I defended it on the 15th February of 2015. And notice it's today August 18, so it's uh, three years later. But it's going to be the presentation like I did all my defense, um, more or less, trying to be fruitful to it. The topic of my research is basically about novelty regulation. So it's an interdisciplinary study on this novelty regulation. And the reason we investigate novelty regulation is to produce radical change. Now, before we can start, we need to make some concepts clear. So what do we mean with novelty? Novelty is what did not exist before, but emerges into existence. Now, it's a abstract concept which will be more concretely uh, recognized in creativity, discovery, inventions and innovations and particular to the last innovation it's interesting to see how we can create radical change in a more systematic way. That's the whole purpose of the PhD. Now we cannot create uh, something out of nothing, right? So there is a certain cost, there is a certain conservation and uh, we will investigate how the novelty uh, mechanism is capable of doing that. So uh, the, the novelty mechanism is something we have observed, observed in several domains. Uh, the novelty regulation will be the system feedback structure describing how that novelty mechanism works. So it's a more abstract version of it. The disciplines describing the novelty mechanisms are several, that's why we had to do an interdisciplinary PhD. We started with research on artificial intelligence and specifically on creativity and what we like to call higher level of cognition. So it's not about the conditioning, but once you're capable of doing what deep learning is doing today, how can you then start saying anything about creativity? That's the, that was the focus of the research. So it expanded into the, the more interdisciplinary field of cognitive science. So looking at uh, why perception is an illusion and stuff like that. But uh, the mechanism is specifically focused on the process of creating stuff, creativity. Now, to our surprise, we actually seen that the same feedback mechanism was discovered in, well, or described, not so much discovered, but described in different domains, like the science and technology studies looked at the emergence of science and wanted to know how it actually comes out of the social fabric and described the same feedback mechanism. Strategic management studies uh, investigating how to deal with innovation from a strategic point came to the same feedback system. And within the methodological research, uh, they came up with this concept called design science research uh, for, do, for uh, supervising project development. And eventually they also came up with this same feedback system. So the fact that the same feedback system uh, is indeed an abstraction, but it's an abstraction made by several people in different domains should kind of uh, start making us wonder what, what is this? And that's why we define it as something more abstract being novelty, um, the novelty mechanism and not just a creativity mechanism or discovery mechanism or innovation mechanism. So that's the, the setting. An overview. We describe the novelty mechanism, particularly developed in the concept of a workspace. So novelty is being created within a workspace. Um, we look at the different uh, disciplines, so how did they come to these concepts, finding the dynamics of this innovation, designing the structures to manage radical innovation, so that's where we want to head at, so if there is a structure feedback mechanism, can we actually create, call it an IT infrastructure, call it collective intelligence platform, platforms are pretty well known now, um, in strategic management literature, they talk about agile enterprise, trying to be at the same time a large enterprise, but have the features we know of startups. So that's their uh, terminology. We just uh, adopted it a bit to explain our own stuff. And then we're going to the empirical investigation. So how do you actually well, verify and uh, see if what we have actually makes sense? 
We did educational experiments on complex knowledge creation. And we did participation research on self-organizing innovation. Basically, uh, this is a, a digital community business ecosystem of many startups. And uh, we looked at how they were doing innovation and came that, to the conclusion that it was self-organizing thanks to the system structure. So that kind of empirically uh, shows how this novelty production can be applied and understood in reality. Um, well, yeah, and then we create a model to manage this radical change. So that's the whole process, that's the overview. Going to cognitive science and the very first uh, uh, investigations we did, it was based on what is called uh, evolutionary, uh, evolutionary artificial life uh, simulations. So you start with agents in a certain settings and you try to see one evolutionary step. So we did it in specifically with this, uh, the, the, the concept was how does an ape break a nut, right? And investigating this uh, in, a, in a simulation way, we discovered that the creative process to, to be able to do that um, requires a very complex, ambiguous environment. So ambiguity turned out to be an essential part of the process. So the, if, if you need to start with being able to just pick up the nut meat and eat it, understand that there is nut meat in shells and then come to the harder shells knowing that there is uh, food in there and finding ways to actually then uh, solve that problem. So the way it works is by, by having two kind of what we call anticipation processes. Anticipation process is basically a feedback and a feed forward. So in this case you, we see the feed forward. What happens is you have some prior knowledge in your long-term memory and before the thing happens, you actually put it in your workspace. And at the same time, the things that happen are in the workspace, you can actually uh, put it and figure out if you can fi find it in the environment. So on the one hand, you have things that will be uh, anticipating associations. And on the other hand, it will be anticipating perceptions. So it fits a bit with what we know from uh, the... the, the cognitive sciences and the feedback will actually be then the learning part but in this sense it's it's really very narrow on the associations and the sensing itself so to give a little illustration how that works take that at the very first milliseconds just light enters your eye and there is like this this blurry uh, thing you see where there is some light and some darkness so but you internally you've got no clue what's happening just there's some, but you know here um, on the sensing part, you can actually start doing stuff. You can figure out like, okay, what are the boundaries? So that's what happens with very fast uh, eye movement. They jump over the boundaries. They, 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 the assumption we make from, from the novelty production is that actually this creates this evolutionary cybernetics where it will actually go into more detail, creating a shape, saying, so, okay, so this is round. So you don't see fake, no, no, make it round. So we'll make it a little bit more round. Um, going too fast. Um, round can actually have several associations. So we can say, okay, it's a, maybe it's a ball, maybe it's an apple, maybe it's a face. But all those of these uh, concepts, um, if they are already in the prior knowledge, you can actually start uh, verifying using the sensing. So you say, okay, are there stripes? Is there... Are the eyes probably will go for face first? Um, so you go for face is recognized clearly, and uh, so the image pops up. So that's what we know with Gestalt that um, we first it, it can go from something unrecognized and suddenly it becomes very sharp. But we can actually explain this a little bit by this two interlocked anticipation processes working on the same working memory. And that's the essence, working on the same memory. Um, the thing is, this is actually also uh, described in neurological studies, and specifically the HANA, uh, shows how this global workspace ex exists in your brain. And there's all these kind of connections to the other parts of the brain modules. And um, 
the, 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 that's the first time that we discovered that the mechanisms we described in the artificial simulations are actually observed in uh, brain uh, research as well. First of all, you have this long-term memory that's coming in, so those are all these anticipation structures creating this uh, interrelation with the global workspace. You have this perceptional system, so that's a bit of the same as with the, uh, the, the simulations. Now there are three more things, and one of them, obviously, is the motor system response. So it's not just a, a complex uh, perception and memory relation, but in, in, if we do anything, it's also a complex motor output. Now the other two, we actually also have them in the experiments, but I didn't explain them yet. And uh, what you also have is an attention system, so that's uh, creating focus. For example, if you uh, see a ball, uh, maybe your attention is to play and catch it. Maybe your attention is to not get hurt and flee from it. So that's what your attention system will uh, create a very different context on the, 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 the two basic uh, interactions. The third one, and that's an interesting one, it's an evaluation system. So even in your brain, past experience uh, will um, be uh, picked up to figure out uh, if this was uh, something you wanted or not, and therefore create uh, learning over time. So while this first three, the focus, the perception and the associations is something that happens now here, the evaluation system is actually something to reflect over longer periods of time. So they also show how this is uh, cognitively explained. If I link it to uh, a more abstract novelty mechanism, I can see this long-term memory as the internal thing. So it's internalizing what you see. Uh, this is externalizing, connecting what is in the workspace with uh, what you see, perceive around you. So it's not just seeing, it can be hearing, touching, whatever. Um, the attention system creates focus, so it gives direction. While the value system, so that's the past experience that allows you to, to actually do what we really consider as learning. So that evolves the whole um, Thing. So the, the other three create the present and this actually creates real learning. Now, so the novelty mechanism, the, the very basic thing that we saw with the face recognition is just internalizing out of some past. So we, we don't talk about um, long-term memory that's specific to cognition. We can just talk about the system core while the externalizing is still the environment. That's a little bit more similar. The directing is working directly on the workspace. So it's actually the things that have been put in the workspace by the internalizing, by the externalizing, and internalizing, uh, may just get a different flavor. That's basically the, what directing is doing, creating a different focus. And to get back out of the workspace, you get this evolving where. Um, or with the motorical response in the cognitive case, you, you change the environment or with the learning, you, you change the system core. But again, it's more generalized. And the reason for that uh, will be the other uh, descriptions of this mechanism. Uh, overcoming a conservation cost. Conservation has a cost, right? So something cannot be created out of nothing. The best way to actually understand this, and I believe this is like um, the most primitive way to understand the novelty regulation, is by considering a, um, um, the how you sail against the wind, right? So just to see, show that this this costs. What, what does it mean? How do this internalizing, externalizing actually become uh, more physically understood? We we have this. Uh, it starts as a metaphor, but it becomes more mathematically afterwards. So you have the wind. You have the, the sail over here. In best case, you actually get like a lift force that will be with a 90 degrees uh, angle to the wind. So in the best case, so this, in, this is almost the, the absolute best case, right? So, uh, but it can never be against the wind. So what happens to, how do you create it against the wind? First of all, the, the, the way the boat is uh, in the water it actually creates friction with the water it's around it. 
and there becomes a force, a reactive force on the keel that will be smaller than the, the lift force, but it will be uh, in the right direction. So if you combine those two, you actually get a force, and so you see the cost because this is a much larger force than this. For example, if you uh, link it back to the cognition, this is all things you can imagine. But all things you can imagine are not all the things you can create. So, so reality creates a restriction and what you get out of it is new things that may not really be what you wanted, right? So that's a little bit awkward, but it actually, the awkward part is the, key, the thing that puts you inside the direction you want, the novelty. So, okay, so it's not straight to the wind. So the last thing that needs to happen is, uh, oh, well, too fast. The, this you can link to the internalizing, but I already said it's like imagine. And this you can link to the externalizing, all the things that are real. The directing can actually be this angle. Like if you put the boat straight, uh, there won't be any combined force. There would just be the, 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 the force on the sail. If you put it on the other side, it will also just stand still. So you, you have this angle where the optimal is, of course, uh, uh, 45 degrees. Um, but you could actually see that this is also what, what directs you to, to where you want to go. Now, if you really want to go straight into the wind, you need to have this leviation. So you, you go from A, you switch the other direction, B, and you, you can go to C. Uh, if you translate it to the learning part, you can actually see that uh, there's a, a, a moment where you have an idea and you need to be master, uh, become uh, skilled in that uh, thing. And once you have mastered it, you can actually then uh, go back and um, uh, reflect on what you've been doing. So, so mastering and reflecting is the the other is the the, the same in learning as like switching in this purely physical uh, sense from A to B. Okay, so that's the, the basics principle um, and how it relates. Now, if I really want to uh, figure out like what is the most minimal thing for for this novelty mechanism to emerge, right? So how does it work? It, it If you look at a workspace, right, this one is a highly creative uh, Team probably that's that's been doing all kind of crazy stuff. You see the, the environment they've been using to to for all their creations. Now in this case, the input for the things happening, so putting these things here on this table, those are intelligent agents, and they create artifacts. So that's what we do. That's we invent and innovate and create and so on. Um, but this is actually a very highly sophisticated interface. We are the interface. The the people the intelligent agents so we, we've been figuring out like related to the origin of life what is the minimal kind of conditions to create this novelty mechanism we just saw um, um, the sailing against the wind as an example so that's purely physical so can we actually have creativity creation at a purely physical level uh, to answer that we actually get deeper into dissipative systems and origin of life and uh, eventually to this uh, advanced state of um, dissipative self-organizing systems. So what you see over here, the very first circle is um, the, the convection cells uh, from a top view. And those are little bubbles trying to actually disperse the heat as much as possible. Now the next cases, they are different related to the temperature put on the boundary. So if you put a certain kind of temperature, you get this picture. If you get another uh, uh, temperature, you get that picture. So that means that there's now a relation between the internal pattern and an input. So heat boundary produces a difference in variant patterns. So those are very temporary artifacts. You take out the heat and the, the artifacts disappear. But they are artifacts. They are created. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a process of the self-organization. So it only exists inside the workspace and it needs the different mediums to get the artifact into the environment. So how do you get actually this information outside? Well, in a purely physical sense, you cannot. 
So going to a chemical sense, well, we can we can do that, and that's what we see with with uh, the very basic foundations of life. Basically, they are creating artifacts. They are fabricating artifacts. The the RNA creates proteins. That's the exactly what we have. Now it creates artifacts, but the information over here is still very uh, bound by uh, uh, the physical constraints. Why, well, if we go to the neural level, uh, we actually create um, this artifacts unbound by. Uh, the purely physical constraints so we create knowledge and that actually allows for autonomous agents so well we already had at the biochemical level the creation of fabric cuts but as a as, as more like an, uh, a, a, a fabric it's a machine it's uh, well at the neural level you actually get this abstract thing called knowledge um, we can actually also go to a meta workspace. So that's uh, when we go to inventions and innovations. And what happens there is that a, a workspace of workspace creates the radical change. So, so it's also with origin of life we get it, but it's a little bit more complicated to explain over there. With this, it's easier to explain. Take, for example, electricity. You just have like all these cells of people working on this one thing related to this electricity but combined they create this ecosystem that allows for the radical change so novelty mechanism emerge in a certain sense um, you can actually see that if this is the case well and you put on natural selection on, on this uh, workspace of workspaces then the mechanism that will get out of it as the most fit the most uh, uh, evolutionary fit would be one that actually implements this novelty mechanism. So this way you can actually understand that although the novelty mechanism is a pretty complicated case, if you from a from a purely natural selection, it's it's a very logical case. It's a, it's not that far fetched. Okay, uh, we're gonna look at the uh, those workspaces as uh, they've been defined in different domains. So we already seen that the uh, the different modules which are workspaces of workspaces actually in in our brain it becomes this global workspace it would be very interesting to see if more primitive uh, brains have um, more this workspace of works and like a more primitive version of of, of this uh, evolution that that would be a way to start verifying more so if you could actually get into that that could be some verification of this uh, structure um, the other one is described by Latour. Uh, first of all, in 1987, uh, he has this concept of uh, science in action and how science is entwined with the, the world, creating this kind of um, yeah, whirlpool-like structure where money, workforce, instruments, objects, uh, arguments, and then it jumps, the innovation jumps to a higher level all the time. So. Um, getting into more detail like okay that was okay but not very accurate so going to more detail he actually describes this novelty mechanism where you have first of all the mobilization of the world you create these instruments and the instruments allows you to uh, create new arguments of the world and um, now some people need to understand that so that's the colleagues that that actually reason and discuss all of that and he called it the autonomization, basically because one colleague can uh, be replaced by the other. And if you put more of these colleagues together, you, it actually, by peer learning, it accelerates. So, so this is an important extra dimension next to the instruments. Uh, a third dimension, so, so that's the, the thing we saw before, right? That's what you get over here. The third dimension is allies. So what you see is that if it's not just a research, but if it has economical benefits or, or, or military benefits or political benefits, doesn't matter what kind of allies you create, but the difference between an ally and a colleague is a colleague wants to actually get the same thing, understand this stuff. An ally has uh, alternative motives, so that's why it's a different dimension. It's, it stands in, in contrast to what the colleagues want and do, also with body of knowledge. 
The third one, and that may today it's less of a surprise, but when it was published, it's more of a surprise. It's uh, the public representation. For example, um, if the public is uh, beneficial to it, it will work. If it's uh, if it's uh, negative against it, it will uh, be hard. Uh, Many of the, the 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 digital development we saw recently was uh, very much appreciated by the public, and therefore, like think about social media, it's it it it, it boomed. Uh, why? Because it's very appreciated by the public. While if you think like uh, genetically manipulated uh, organisms or uh, research on embry embryos, those are very negatively perceived by public, and therefore it's hard to do any research on it. The best example we can we, we have over here is with nuclear research. Uh, during a war period, it was very beneficial because it was about surviving. Uh, but afterward, even for, for uh, public uh, use, like uh, nuclear power plants, it was actually negative perceived for the long-term effect. So you see how this public and these side skies actually influence very much what can be created and whatnot. You can again uh, see how this relates to the more abstract novelty mechanism where the instruments internalize. The, co the, the externalizing is actually the public. That's what makes it easier or hard, like the angle with the, uh, the, the sailing. Uh, the directing is much related to the allies. Uh, like, and the, the, there are many examples where you see that certain allies will actually direct for example if you think about nuclear fusion the the very first allies were military so it relates to creating the bombs well afterwards the allies were uh, electricity companies and so on so it's a uh, it shifts and it changes the the way the whole evolution develops and then how does it evolve? Well, it only can evolve with colleagues, which is the reason you see that peer learning and peer publication and peer 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 is the essence for any of this academic work world because that's how it evolves. Uh, nothing very strange here, but the interesting thing is that this specific feedback system was this, uh, uh, described by uh, science studies. A third one related to innovation. Uh, this is Christensen showing how you have this uh, deliberate strategy. Most companies really like to say that they have a very deliberate strategy, but eventually see that this emerging strategy just happens equally as well. So basically what happens is the organization has values. The, there is this resource allocation process happening. There is investment, new process, service, all kind of stuff, whatever you can do, actions, right? And therefore, something happens. That's the actual strategy, which very often can be very different between the deliberate strategy. So, so that's the unanticipated opportunities, problems, and successes. And if they recognize they get this emerging strategy, then starts uh, changing it. So we again have this modeling and mastering happening as we had mm -hmm. with, with the other uh, examples. Now, a bit later on, there is it's not related. That's interesting. Christensen came up with this model. And if you look at the dynamic capability framework for T's and colleagues, uh, it comes from a way more classical strategic management resource. So there's no direct link, uh, but they come to the same, uh, everything is emerging into the same. So what they do is they say this bundle of resources allows you to understand what, what is the core of this business. You have this externalizing, those are the positions. That's how you get perceived by the market, what's your brand and stuff like that. There is direction. So of course you have this historical path that, that kind of defines in which direction the, the company can go. Um, and then you have the evolving uh, by what is called the organizational processes, which lately becomes more agile to, to adapt faster to changes. But there can be good reasons to have very static uh, processes, uh, particularly in, if it's uh, like a very, um, uh, the, if the risk is very high. For example, if you play with lives of we were if we we're talking about uh, a space where the cost uh, to get there is very high, you actually see that the process become way less agile. So that's uh, how it evolves. Now, the the last one uh, we discovered is actually the most recent one. So only 2011, if you see that, um, that's the same year I did my, uh, my 
last validation. So this actually really uh, came to the last moment. So, but there was this discussion. Uh, first of all, uh, what is action research? Um, so it's just iterations of planning, acting, and reflecting. It's already a lot older. The, the, there was this publication about design science research as an as it's a little bit loose. It wasn't directly connected to the action research, where they talk about prototype uh, to guide the development. And then there was a whole debate like, oh, you know, design science research that's the same as action research, and then people came up, no, it's not the same, like, for example, with this life-threatening and um, very expensive project, it's not at all the same, because you, you are not allowed to, to take, make a lot of uh, mistakes. Um, and then they came up with this idea, okay, so how would it look if it would be the same? And then they came up with this uh, structure, and not going too much into detail now, but uh, the, 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 the same mechanisms can be discovered, there is this problem formulation which which is creating the internalizing you have this build invent and evaluate which it's all kind of external feedback so there's this externalizing um, the, the, there's a little bit uh, confusion that this is also called reflection and action but if you look at the principle it's guided emergence so that's uh, the thing that actually defined how it will direct and out of it, um, there is the last one that generalizes the outcome, that's the evolving process. So again, you can actually pretty clearly see the same feedback uh, mechanism, the same novelty mechanism um, in this uh, study. What we start doing is actually, um, by investigating all these different models, we figure out, like, wait a minute, there are actually each of them are defining this novelty mechanism in a different dimension. So we can actually create this abstraction and understand that whatever you put your internalizing, externalizing, directing and evolving on, that's the thing you will create novelty around. Like in cognitive science, this will be new knowledge. In uh, strategic uh, uh, science studies, this will be um, yeah, well uh, new tools, artifacts, uh, like we like coming out of the, the research labs. In strategic management, this is mostly related to organizations. So this is a new kind of organization. Today it's a lot about flat organizations, self-organized organizations. And in design science research, it's about new methodologies, new ways of developing it all. But in a certain way, you can actually see that this is, again, an abstract, uh, you, can, you can do another uh, jump to another level and understand how new knowledge, new artifacts, new structures and new processes are also again this internalizing, externalizing, directing. So this is like a meta model and that's the thing we've been focusing on. So can this meta model actually allow us to create radical innovations? So uh, create internal knowledge, create enrichment, create the organizations and create the development. That's the, the design part. So now, how do we get actually practical? Um, if we go to innovation literature, we got something called, uh, it's Roger that published it in 1962, about adaptation of the innovation. And you have these innovators going very early, very committed. You got the adopters that really want it and are capable of uh, taking a lot of the, the, um, the early bugs uh, with it. Then you've got the early majority that's, uh, that, that's more like uh, interested in new hip stuff. Then you've got the late majority that will follow and then the laggers that actually really, really don't want to follow but kind of get uh, forced into it. Now, if, if, we, if we look at this uh, curve, it's a, it's a normal distribution. If you look at the total of it, you see that um, it, it becomes this S-curve. And this S-curve is often described in innovation literature as, as something that is happening. We've defined it in five phases. A premature, incubation, growth phase, landing phase, and maturity phase. Based on how it accelerates or this is more constant, this is hardly any, and there there's a nice uh, exponential. So can we actually uh, connect that to many of those literatures and how does that relate to what is the novelty, what is the workspace? So in the premature phase, it's all about networking, it's about um, 
uh, individuals uh, connecting one-on-one. -on -one. So it's a, a teacher-apprentice relation or peer learning uh, relations. What is mostly, uh, you see this of course in, in academia a lot, so it's, there's a lot of creating of the concepts and you actually create a workspace. Now, I say mostly in academia because lately you've got a lot of to do with uh, living labs and other things where actually you get into this more um, public domain where people create new ideas, concepts, and the laboratories are basically just the, 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 the living labs that they create. So it's, it's not uniquely to science, to, to academia. Uh, but what you do see is that once individuals being networking a lot, uh, you can actually see a group formation happening. So that's what happens during the incubation phase. The groups are formed and you see that then the concepts that were more loosely virtual in, in, in this first phase becomes more like prototypes in the second phase, become artifacts on their own. And the workspace uh, changed from a laboratory to a, a workshop. So it's it's going from the lab into the, the R&D part. So and you see that in, in any cases, in, like a startup is often a, a group with a few people, never a network of people. That's, that's more a community, that's really the startup part. Now, if you go one more, you get actually to organizations and you go to a growth phase where the, the, the focus is not anymore about the prototype, showing it, demonstrating it, understanding it, like, like you have a community interest, community of practice and that kind of stuff. But you, got, you go to product and you go to um, having an organization that is creating this product. This phase, it becomes way more autonomous and less dependent on the individuals. You don't see individuals in here, you see groups connected to each other and people can actually flow in and out more easily than in previous cases. It comes more uh, uh, infrastructure being created, there are frameworks created, we see these ecosystems, so you get, so it's a change of uh, organizations to, to like supply chain, but you also got sectors where where there are uh, intersectoral uh, um, demands, so it becomes a bit more complicated and then you get to a final phase where actually everything comes so regulated that um, it, it looks ambient, it's, uh, it's as, if, as if the organization and the groups don't exist anymore, but it's basically because it's everywhere that it seems like it's not existing, so it enriches and it goes global. Now. We've actually looked at um, how this can relate to a methodology where, where you actually see that uh, concepts get funneled uh, from prototype to product. You, you see a lot of this venture capital coming in to, to actually pump it up. And now once you actually have these products and clients all doing this stuff, it starts expanding again because they wanted to uh, have more products and, and have more markets, so it expands again to this part and then it evaporates as, uh, in, in the last part. So we've been using this as a, a more advanced uh, methodology to look at it, so it's a funnel tube and horn. What you get is at the, the, the level of the, the, the funneling and the tube, there's the same kind of what we call bootstrapping, dynamic capping. So it, it jumps from one side to the other, actually with one tool, second tool, third tool, and so on. And there is also this, this uh, scaffolds one, two, three, four, until you actually get to this more robust prototype. Um, let's keep up the, the, the pumping up part here a bit. And then we can see that the product and we see the same stuff, but in reverse uh, order where more tools are created and more um, scaffolds are needed, like uh, specific markets, knowledge, and all kinds of that kind of stuff. So, okay. Um, the, the spreading activation, that's more what we, we know from venture capital, you got this seed round that often is even before there's really a prototype, mostly if you have a proof of concept, that's, that's when it happens. And the amount of, of, of uh, the, the pool of research that, that's getting pumped in becomes bigger and bigger until you actually have real company and you get like public rounds where the, the, the real big uh, resources get uh, pulled in. So, but the essence is you start with a cloud of products and you end with an ecosystem of products. So, 
cloud of prototypes ending with an ecosystem of products. And that's what you can see when there's a certain trend around the digital transformation. Uh, during this PhD, it was about content management system and you saw all these kind of different things related to content management, but in the end, there was a pretty robust ecosystem, but it's not like one product existed at front, it's everything emerges uh, simultaneously. Okay, to the empirical investigations, trying to figure out how we can use this method and this uh, um, novelty mechanisms to, to do anything. We, uh, so we looked at uh, education and we asked how can we make education more agile thanks to all videos and stuff. And you need to see this is during 2006 and 2010. This is in the background when there was a lot uh, to do about massive online data massive online courses. So how do you learn something that can change so fast that your knowledge is obsolete by the time you learn it? That was the setting we, we, we wanted to investigate and see how we can actually use this novelty mechanism and this record change for it. So the, it relates to the method. So what we actually had is intern, uh, internet entrepreneurs. That's what we wanted to actually produce, create. And we had this student skills to start with. So what we needed to do is, on the one hand, um, train the students, right, with multiple programming languages. Then, uh, in specifically, I had this Drupal, uh, which is a content management system where they have to develop and then uh, use API integration. So basically, it, it it ended up being a course on API integrations. Yeah, so how does it happen with the the other side? How do you get down here? Um, the, the the idea is to become an internet entrepreneur, but first of all, you need to start participating. Um, yeah, well, the the okay. The, so this was um, related to the participation research I did with this Drupal community, um, where I first of all start just uh, participating, trying to understand what are they doing, how are they doing it, why are they doing it, all that kind of stuff. And while I start understanding it better and better, I start interviewing uh, all the entrepreneurs to figure out why they were doing uh, the, what they were doing. And so you get deeper in understanding what really is this internet entrepreneurship. So, so this basically ends up in a course um, that was, uh, uh, but, but it started already in the beginning as a way of vaguer concept. And it ended in a course called Web Service Development for Business, which is a terrible name, but it uh, it's, fits the description. If I look at it from the, the that's the, my view, so how did the course uh, emerge? If we look at it from the student's view, it's, a, it's similar, but a little bit different. So you also start with the student. So now here you had the students, so the group of students, their skills. Here you start with a student, his skills and looking at the, the project they want to reach. And so what they needed to do is, uh, uh, first of all, understand what is the basic idea of a, a web-based uh, program, and um, then start understanding, okay, so what is uh, software design? How do you do that? And then we needed that interoperability, and uh, at that time it was uh, integrating in, in Drupal modules. Um, if you look at it from their project, so they had a vague idea of a project, they start blogging about the project and um, getting feedback, peer learning feedback from the other students. Um, and then um, once they, they got more uh, detail about that, they need to start uh, integrating the APIs and explore it. And eventually the, the better students start actually creating their micro spin-offs, so creating an actual product. They put, well, proof of concept. They actually try to get, create a, a startup from. Um, so the participation research, just to give a, a quick idea, this is the conference we organized in 2006. And I think this is uh, only three years later. So the, 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 the amount of people involved in that project kind of it was exponential. And it was an interesting uh, understanding to see this transformation, this growth and so on. Uh, but what was interesting, why specific Drupal? Because there was this crazy thing about the, the culture where people expressed their love for this 
IT, right, for software, strange. In, in all kind of other ways, they start building, baking cakes, knitting sockets, create all kind of uh, interesting uh, logo variants because they like it. And so <laughs> one of the conferences, this was Paris actually, uh, a guy starts running around in this. This wasn't created by the organizers, but, but just one company that was really fond of Drupal and the, the conference and start doing that kind of crazy stuff. So culture, that's the thing. What, what is this culture underlining this self-organization? The interviewing, those are the companies uh, I've all interviewed um, to figure out what, they, what, what their perception was of the whole evolution. So I'm not going to go into detail here. Um, so that's the, the first part where, uh, where I learned a lot about this, this process, this, uh, this community. But then there was a thing about, OK, so how, would, how can we um, scale it up? Because the problem with the micro spin-offs is that it actually becomes pretty intense to the supervisor. So in 2010, 2011, we had a, a, a new opportunity. There was this uh, course where three supervisors couldn't supervise 300 students. And the next year, uh, one supervisor had to supervise 400 students. So it's, uh, again, this, this radical challenge. So how do we develop a workspace for that? We've done it and it's worked, so <laughs> it was successful. Um, but that's more related to, we had a course, right? And it is about uh, an, an education with a, with a, so adapting the content management system to become an education management system, call it, right? Um, we had recorded lectures, we developed the instructions of how to reach it. So that's the phase we were when we got into this problem, this, this challenge. And then was a challenge, okay, so how do we now scale the teacher? To do that, uh, we added a peer review system for learning. So that's based on, so it's, it's an extra tool, right? It's not just having all the courses uh, with videos and, and, and have uh, blogs and all kind of interaction. Things you know clearly from uh, the online course uh, systems today, um, but also have the peer learning. Uh, what uh, was added to to the uh, to, to the instructional side? So we had first of all these recorded lectures, then we had the development instructions, and then eventually had also online coordination by peers. So we had this uh, basically we adapted. I think it's in the next slides. Yeah, um, we had this uh, issue queue like we know it from the software developers. And uh, where, but is this just used by the developers to, to ping when, when there is a, a bug or a new feature or whatever, just to manage that? And we, uh, we extended it to start using it for peer evaluation, so with the reviews and evaluations. And the top here, you see one of these issues. So what is an issue? An issue is one part of a project assigned to one person. So something one person can do. It's a small building block of work that can be done by a person. So in projects, you could have actually several people with many different issues. So it's more distributed in that sense. And what we added, for example, after, I mean, the, the active issues, the closed issues, the, the solved issues, that's green, white, and red, that's basically common to the software development stuff. What we added over here, the yellow part is when it needs review. So what happened when it needs review, you can actually, as a student, add review. And that's what you see below here. This is an issue called financing higher education in Nigeria by a certain student. And then we had two other students creating reviews of it. And this review claimed it was a good issue. And this review claimed it was a so-so issue. It was OK. And then you see that the, the evaluations of this review showed that this one actually wasn't that good of a uh, review. Well, this was a, a good review. And so the weights of these stars would uh, count up into, uh, oh, I don't have a, a presentation of that, but you can see it in the PG itself. It would count up to um, the score the, uh, the students get at, uh, for, for the course. 
And the, the whole thing it was a very interesting learning curve of how this uh, self-organizing can snowball using complexity, using uh, a lot of psychology, like uh, uh, few autodidacts that would start and then you, you, you would, uh, you would cr gradually uh, have that curve from early adapters until the laggers that you need to, to uh, uh, pull into the system. So all this stuff was, was happening. And it also shifted uh, the task of the teacher from first of all giving a good review, why was this a good issue, to giving evaluation, why was the review uh, good or bad, to actually having a small army of students who were your assistants. So it, it, it shifts from the pure development and shifts all the way to uh, people management, basically. Okay, so uh, done those education stuff, uh, done the, the the participation stuff. We figured out like, okay, what's what's the where is all this going to? And therefore, we come to this concept of the interversity, which because a lot of the things that related to the discovery in the science, uh, the science uh, technology research that uh, we showed from the other. Um, uh, investigations they so many of those things we didn't touch yet so we were actually interested in, in this concept of an interversity where a university is actually about universal knowledge but today we live in a in more in in a in a time uh, mind that we, we know that having all knowledge becomes impossible so the idea idea of a university becomes built of uh, outdated so can we actually go to an interversity for more complex adaptive world where it is not about having all the knowledge but about creating the needed relations. So having this self-organizing and distributed by IT support like we demonstrated with the education, can we actually also bring it to the research? So it's a synergy between education, research and public services or really the the, the, the one we, we didn't touch that level yet. We, we, we sticked just to the knowledge creation, which was one of the four uh, parts of the, the, the system, but we, we wanted to, to figure out how to go in the next part. So in this sense, we really want to then look at a workspace for spinning of radical change. So how do you go from this project-oriented education allowing knowledge creation to this public service where you go uh, from in where, where you got uh, incubators centered to, uh, to an ecosystem. So, oh. so basically what, what we observed with the participation research was natural selection, was very, uh, wasn't um, uh, designed. Uh, the question is, can we actually create, artificially create this phase transition from um, a cloud of prototypes to an ecosystem of products. And um, both those both domains seem to, to show that what the, the future of a university can be. So this is a little bit uh, the, the, the thing we, we see as the moonshot where we can go to. I guess this is the Overview then, okay. Describing the novelty mechanism, so in particular we developed the concept of a workspace, show that it actually can uh, get back to purely physical stuff. We, we, I'm actually in the process of understanding the mathematics of how to describe that. Uh, investigating the novelty me uh, mechanism across disciplines. Uh, so we've shown during the PhD that we can see this, uh, this system dynamics uh, uh, reappearing. And in postdoc research, actually, I've been looking at uh, how to translate this more to uh, things that business can understand. So, like uh, audits and workshops that that helps change management, designing structure to to manage the radical change. That's at HL Enterprise Innovation Planning, uh, and I'm not yet in the process. Uh, that there is a big enough company interested in actually creating the infrastructure, but there are talks. Uh, empirical investigation, that's what, what I showed during the PhD. So you have the education experiments to, to create complex knowledge and the participation research on the self-organization innovation. There are still some developments in both. Uh, the 
the education is now way more related to classical education, the, the actual transformation of, uh, of um, technical schools that's happening. The participation research uh, shifted away from purely software to uh, Internet of Things kind of stuff. So more that there's hack communities and uh, other uh, like fabrication labs that are popping up uh, and you can do participation research over there now. Um, and also incubators. There are many incubators popping up and that's also a space where I'm doing participation research at the moment. And modeling a bigger picture on managing radical change. Actually, we had this with, with uh, some other um, developments, but uh, well, that's not more related to the PGT. So this was the overview. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, limitation of the research. Okay, the research is mostly theoretically. Uh, theory still needs a lot of verification. So we've got so many things uh, to, that are still out there, right? The experiments are only about one aspect. Like I said, it's mostly about the knowledge creation. We made designs of how to get this to actually artific artifacts and creating those, uh, but it's still work in progress. Uh, the other problem what with the scale of the interversity is huge. So we actually had a trading machine in 2012, but well, it's uh, there, there, the time spirit is, is not yet uh, on it. Um, so it stays hard to do the empirical research. The interdiscipline makes it also hard because like, first of all, finding peers for evaluation is hard. But on the other hand, trying to publish this, you, you get the problem that uh, the, it's not uh, strictly enough for certain journals. So because it's interdisciplinary and therefore it becomes by, uh, it, it creates a paradox actually. It's, a, it's kind of a irony, but that's the fact. Conclusion. So we propose a new research theory. So that's the novelty mechanism and looking at the workspace. Um, the, the, so I actually want to say that, um, the, before I go, continue here, this actually can have very purely theoretically uh, development. I'm, I'm actually looking pretty much in it at the moment, um, uh, related to a lot of um, uh, recent developments also in, in quantum theory, but the mathematics mostly of quantum theory allowing us to get the cognition more uh, detailed. So there's a lot of work that I, I was surprised, I must say, that when I, when I presented my PhD, I wouldn't expect that this part uh, uh, would start uh, continuing so fast, so I'm uh, pretty much into it. Uh, research on radical innovation management, I actually expected this to, to be more uh, possible and I figured out, after, so I've, I've done two years of a startup and I figured out that it's, it's not uh, easy at all because um, yeah, well, startups uh, relate to what is the trend and the, the trend is big data, machine learning, Internet of Things. But if you want to do something like a coordinating complex uh, interactions, that's kind of, huh? uh, okay, so figure out that's not the, not very easy to uh, continue. The, the theory eventually turns out to be easier to continue. Improvement of research methods, uh, a combination of the experiments, participation, and the, the theory. Um, what did I want to say about that? Um, well, the, I always said that at the moment uh, we can actually continue the research if we go to the do-it-yourself community and the hackers community. That's one part. Um, there are many other parts where you can try to improve the research method, but it's been a tiresome process for now. And direction for future research, future research from interversity to change management approach. So I actually uh, worked on that uh, together with my co-founders, seeing how we actually can do that. Um, the, 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 the sad thing is that um, as of yet, we didn't really had a, a big consulting company that that consider this an opportunity. So far, we've only been 
uh, experienced as a threat, sadly. Um, so we stopped the startup for that reason because we didn't want to compete and become our own consulting company. So we'll, we need to see how that can continue. Uh, there are talks with some consulting companies, but uh, well, okay. It is what it is. Uh, new participation experiments, they are also happening, uh, mostly in relation to a trend on startups that, that seems to be institutionalizing at the moment. And uh, at the moment, I would actually put my money on this second part and not on the first part. We've tried it, done it, and we'll see how it continues. But uh, the second one is more driven by an external evolution. Well, this, this first part would be driven by a consulting and I don't, it's, it's, there's no, there's no evolutionary pressure on the first one here. So probably they will just all get extinct, I guess. I don't know. It's their life. Um, so, okay, that's uh, the conclusion. That's it. I hope you enjoyed it. Right.